Well, hello and welcome to Complications of Delays in STEMI Treatment. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the president of Ed for Nurses, where we empower nurses to become extraordinary. Join us online by going to www.ed, the number four, nurses.com. What you're listening to today is part of our two-minute EBP challenge. Every week we send out a question, comes to your email on Fridays. You get a chance to answer that question and send in your correct response. Out of the correct responses, someone wins a prize every week. Check it out at www.edfornurses.com, and you can sign up right there on the homepage to get this emailed to you. Every Monday, you get the correct answer, along with our video response, as you're viewing now. Well, this week's question, we're talking about ST Segment Elevation MI. So that's the thing that's really going on here, and we're talking about is our ST Segment Elevation MI, STEMI. ST segment elevation MI is the type of myocardial infarction that occurs in your patient when the patient has EKG changes. Now, in this particular EKG, this is a 12-lead EKG of a patient who is having some EKG changes. And what we're specifically talking about is those ST segment elevations that are very obvious in V1, V2, V3, and V4. So these are leads that are going across the septum and the anterior wall of the patient's heart. So this is probably an anterior septal MI that our patient's having. But at any rate, what we're looking for is we're looking for those ST segment elevations. More on that in a moment. Let's back up a little bit here and talk a little bit about acute coronary syndrome. ST segment elevation MI is one of these things that we have kind of lumped together into this category called acute coronary syndrome. Now, it used to be when a patient came to the hospital and they were complaining of chest pain that we would send them into the hospital and we would rule out MI. So we had this diagnosis for them of rule out MI, which meant that we would do our EKGs, we would do our enzymes, and we would either rule in a myocardial infarction or rule out a myocardial infarction. However, that does not take into account the other processes that are occurring as part of this continuum of a acute coronary syndrome. So the terminology acute coronary syndrome gives us a better idea of the continuum of problems that occurs here as a result of atherosclerosis. So the underlying problem that our patient has is atherosclerosis, which leads to, first of all, stable angina, then unstable angina, then non-ST segment elevation MI, which simply means the patient's having an MI but not having EKG changes, and then lastly, ST segment elevation MI. So on our continuum of problems here, the worst case scenario is the ST segment elevation MI, and that's what we're talking about today. So understand that this is a continuum of problems. Your patient starts out on one end here and is moving down the continuum, sometimes more rapidly than other times, depending upon the type of obstruction that's occurring in the coronary vasculature. Now, I know, for at least for myself, this is kind of confusing stuff. If I try to visualize in my head what stable angina or unstable angina looks like on a patient's myocardium, that's kind of difficult for me to be able to grasp. So one thing that's a little bit easier for me to understand is to think about this process in terms of skin breakdown. So if we're thinking in terms of skin breakdown, obviously there's different degrees of skin breakdown. If you had a patient who just developed a little red spot in the sacrum, as illustrated here in picture A, that's just some ischemia, and that is very similar to what we have when a patient has stable angina. A little bit of skin breakdown, maybe a little blister or something occurring in the patient's uh, sacrum, that is consistent with the patient having injury. Now that injury is consistent with unstable angina, so it's the same kind of process occurring. Next, we get into some real damage occurring to the tissue. When we get down there into C and D, you can see we've got pretty deep kind of injury that's occurring to our patient and probably some necrosis that's part of this as well. So that gets into like full thickness skin breakdown or at least partial thickness skin breakdown that's occurring there. And that's like the myocardial infarction. So it's a matter of degree. The same thing is happening that caused the patient to have a little ischemia, a red spot on the sacrum, as what's happening when the patient has that big, open, gaping 
deep tissue area. It's all a matter of skin pressure and decreased perfusion of the skin. Now, in our patient who's having an MI, it's not skin pressure, obviously, but it's decreased perfusion to the myocardium caused by the patient having an obstruction of the coronary vasculature. Well, our presenting symptom in both of our patients is going to be chest pain. So we anticipate seeing some chest pain. This is the typical presentation of chest pain. The dark or the red area is the area of primary pain. And then the areas that are kind of pinkish in the picture are areas of secondary pain. So it could be radiating to the left arm, typically, also to the right arm, to the jaw, and maybe even to the epigastric area. So chest pain is the usual presenting symptom in our patient. Also, our patient may have EKG changes, and the EKG changes that we're looking at here with an ST segment elevation MI are going to be raised ST segments. So here's an EKG tracing showing a patient who is having some ST segment elevation. In order to determine ST segment elevation, we first need to find the baseline. Now the baseline is that isoelectric line are kind of that bottom line that all of the leads, all of those deflections should come back to. So here I've highlighted the baseline in this patient. Now all of our deflections on this ECG should come back to that baseline. And what you see there is that we have a P wave comes back to the baseline. QRS complex does not come back to the baseline. Instead, it goes right off into the T wave. Now, a normal ECG is going to have the QRS complex come back down to that red baseline and then go off into a T wave. So what I'm talking about here is I'm talking about this. You see how those ST segments, the little blue line there, they're not coming back down to the baseline. They're elevated above the baseline going right off into the T wave. And that's what we call ST segment elevation. The other thing that we can do to validate the fact that our patient is having a myocardial infarction is to look at the patient's enzymes. This is particularly important in patients who have a non-ST segment elevation MI. Non-ST segment elevation MI means that the patient does not have ST segment elevations. In other words, the patient does not have EKG changes. So if there are no EKG changes, the only way that we know our patient's having an MI is to look at the enzymes. Now you'll notice from the picture here that the enzymes don't start to elevate elevate very early on in our process. In fact, the enzymes don't start to elevate till about eight hours. So a patient comes into the emergency department, the patient is complaining of chest pain. We can't rely on enzymes to tell us that the patient possibly is having an MI. The one enzyme there that you may notice, the myoglobin, typically does elevate early in the process within the first hour or so. So the myoglobin may be somewhat helpful and at least finding out that the patient could be having a cardiac problem. Now, myoglobin doesn't just come from the heart. It also comes from the liver and the skeletal muscle. So it comes from all over. So myoglobin is not going to be specific to MI, but it could be an early warning sign for our patient. The worry we have here is that we don't want a patient to have a delay in seeking treatment for the myocardium and the patient's having an MI. As you see in the picture here, it's illustrating these three zones of injury. We have that zone of infarction, the dead skin area in the center, a zone of injury around it, and then a zone of ischemia. The longer we delay in getting treatment to this patient, the more the zone of injury and possibly even the zone of ischemia will become involved in the myocardial infarction and also become necrotic. So we don't want that to happen. Now, the necrotic area, the zone of infarction is dead. We're not bringing that back. Okay, that's going to heal up over a long period of time, but that's not going to be healed up very quickly here. Hopefully, we're not in an area yet where we have a lot of necrotic damage and that maybe some treatment for our patient would be able to turn this around. So there's some delays that can occur. There's patient delays, which is a delay in recognition. The patient's sitting at home thinking, Thinking, gosh, I wonder what this chest pain is caused by. There's a delay in seeking treatment. Maybe the patient has recognized the fact that they're having an MI, but they're going to wait for somebody to come home and take them to the doctor. That would be a delay in seeking treatment. There's also system delays that can occur, delays in diagnosis. So the patient comes into the emergency department. We think, well, it's just indigestion. We have the patient sit back in a waiting room. Okay, that'd be a delay in diagnosis. The other kind of a delay could be a delay in treatment. So the patient's been diagnosed, but we have no definitive treatment for our patient. Now, the kind of treatment that they're talking about in this study is they're talking about using PCI. PCI is percutaneous coronary intervention.
those things are stent placements and angioplasties that are going to help to reopen the vasculature. As illustrated in the diagram here, we have a patient who has atherosclerotic disease, and the first diagram on the left there where it says stent insertion. This patient has already had an angioplasty. So those plaques were actually kind of squeezing in on the inside of the lumen of that vessel and they blew up a balloon and smashed them up against the wall of the vessel. Notice how the vessel's kind of outpouched there. The vessel is kind of uh, swelling in the middle. That's because the angioplasty balloon inflated and pushed the plaques up against the wall. Next we put in a catheter that has a stent on it. The stent is kind of like a little wire frame that is going to sit inside the vessel. So they blow up the balloon again and they expand the stent. That's what's showing here in the middle picture and then over on the right the stent remains in the coronary artery. So this little wire mesh kind of a ladder scheme thing, sits inside the vessel and holds the vessel open so that it won't reocclude. So that's angioplasties and stent placements, and that's what we're talking about here when we're talking about treatment. So they're not talking about running somebody to the OR and doing a cabbage. They're talking about the treatment being PCI. PCI is the preferred method of treatment for patients having an acute myocardial infarction. If we're not able to do PCI, the next option in our arsenal would be to use TPA. Okay, so that's the drug that's going to break down the clot. The third thing we would consider would be cabbage. So if the patient is not a candidate for TPA, not a candidate for PCI, then we would consider the possibility of doing open heart surgery. Now, in this study, they found that for each one hour of delay, and this is system delay. Okay, Patient delay did not have an impact on long-term complications. But for each one hour of system delay, there was an increased risk of heart failure by 10%. So certainly we don't want to have any delays in the patient receiving the treatment once the patient gets to the hospital and the patient is diagnosed. He says, correct. In, in a case of cardiac arrest, every second counts. Who can tell me why? Anyone? Clock's ticking. Okay, yes, and the clock is ticking on this patient having an acute coronary syndrome as well. We don't want to delay any more than is possible once that patient gets to the hospital. So we want to have prompt diagnosis, prompt treatment. System delays are the thing that is causing the patient to develop long-term complications such as heart failure in patients who have a non I have an ST segment elevation MI. Okay, now this article, if you choose to look it up, uh, you can find this in the Annuals in Turtle Medicine, and it's by Dr. Turkelson and colleagues called Healthcare System Delay in Heart Failure in Patients with ST Segment Elevation Myocardial Infarction Treated with Primary Percutaneous Coronary Intervention. Follow up of a population based medical registration data. Thank you for joining me this week for our two-minute EBP challenge. My name is David Woodruff. I am the president of Ed for Nurses, where we empower nurses to become extraordinary. Join us online by going to www.edfornurses.com. Thanks again for joining me for this week's session, and until next time, bye now.